Howdy folks, hope you're ready to have some fun because that's exactly what we're doing in today's Wrath of Math lesson. We'll be proving a very neat corollary of Euler's formula for plane graphs. We proved Euler's formula in the previous lesson. I'll leave a link to that in the description if you are interested. This was requested by a viewer over Instagram. I don't put private messages on the screen, uh, so I'm not gonna show that, but I always appreciate those viewer requests. Be sure to leave yours down in the comments. So what are we proving today? We are proving that for a planar graph, its number of edges, its size, which we're gonna call M, is less than or equal to three times its number of vertices, that's three times N, we're gonna call its number of vertices N minus six. Necessarily, N has to be greater than or equal to three. It's gotta have at least three vertices. For N equals two, the result isn't true, and for smaller N values, this statement doesn't really make any sense. All right, so what we're gonna do first is prove this result for connected graphs. That way we'll be able to use Euler's formula, and then at the end we'll quickly extend it to disconnected graphs. But before we get to that, we just wanna prove it for one graph in particular. Consider all connected plane graphs that have less than three edges and at least three vertices. There's only one such graph. Observation will quickly show us that this is the only connected plane graph with at least three vertices, but fewer than three edges. Let's just point out this does fit our result so we don't have to worry about it for the rest of the proof. How many edges does it have? It's got two. How many vertices does it have? It has three. So this side of the equation or inequality would be three times three minus six. And indeed two is less than or equal to three times three minus six because three times three minus six is three. All right, so the result holds for this graph, the path graph on three vertices. So we can ignore it going forward. That means the size of the graphs we'll be considering are all at least three because one more time, that was the only connected plane graph with at least three vertices and fewer than three edges. So going forward, we can assume that the size of our graphs is at least three. All right, now on to the beginning of the proof for connected planar graphs. Note that this result only has the size and the order of the graph in the inequality. It doesn't involve the number of regions that the graph has. So we don't need to have a plane drawing of a planar graph in order to see that it satisfies this inequality. However, it will be useful to consider a plane drawing of a planar graph for the proof. So we're supposing that we have a connected planar graph G. Now let's consider a drawing of that graph. Graph. So we'll say let G be a plane graph, which means it has been drawn in the plane with no edge crossings, which we know is possible since it is a planar graph. And now we can use this abstract drawing in order to construct our proof. We want to use Euler's formula, which involves the order, size, and number of regions of the graph. The inequality we want to prove, however, does not involve the number of regions in the graph. So we're going to have to craft some relationship between the regions in the graph and either the size or the order of the graph. We're gonna pick size. So we're going to find a relationship between the number of regions in our plane graph and the number of edges in the plane graph. So for convenience, let's start building up a little bit of notation. Let's call the regions in our plane graph. We'll write that over here. We're gonna call the regions in our plane graph R1, R2, and so on, all the way up through some little r region, RR. Now remember that regions have boundaries. The boundary of a region are the vertices and edges that are incident with the region. Each region will have some number of edges in its boundary. We're going to have some notation for those numbers as well. So let's write that over here. So we're gonna say that the number of edges in the boundary of the region Ri, we're going to call those numbers M1, M2, and so on, all the way up through M R, the number of edges in the boundary of the region R sub R. So the M, the number M I is the number of edges in the boundary of the region R I of our plane graph. 
All right, now, what do we know about each of these numbers mi? What do we know about the number of edges that are in the boundaries of all of these regions? Well, I would like to claim that it is greater than or equal to three. That's my claim. How do we know that this is true? Well, if a region isn't the exterior region, you know, this, the, the rest of the unbounded plane, if a region isn't that, then it must be enclosed by some closed curve. And in graph theory terms, a closed curve in the plane, that's gonna have to be a cycle. And a cycle has at least three edges. So again, if a region isn't the external region, the unbounded external region, then, it's got to be closed by some curve. It's got to exist within some curve, which in graph theory, in the plane, that's a cycle, which has to have at least three edges. So for all of those regions, we know this is true, that its boundary has at least three edges. Now, what about the unbounded, which is kind of a strange term to use because it does have a boundary, technically speaking, uh, but we often call it unbounded external region. How many edges will that have? Well, again, I claim that it has at least three. Suppose it doesn't. If it doesn't have at least three edges in its boundary, this external region, then it either has zero, one, or two edges in its boundary. If it has zero edges in its boundary and our graph has at least three edges, which we established earlier, then those zero edges in the boundary of the exterior region must entirely enclose all of the other edges of the graph. Otherwise, those other edges would be incident to the external region and thus would be part of its boundary too. Now that obviously can't be possible. Uh, zero edges can't enclose the rest of the graph. That would have to be a cycle. If the, similarly, if the exterior region's boundary has one edge, that one edge would have to enclose all the other edges of our graph. Otherwise, those other edges of our graph would also be incident to the exterior region and be part of its boundary. So the point is, whether, the, whether we suppose the boundary of the exterior region has zero, one, or two edges, Either way, those zero, one, or two edges have to do something they can't do, which is enclose a region, because we need at least three edges to do that. So clearly it's not possible. The exterior region also has to have a boundary with at least three edges. This part of the proof is often sort of hand-waved in other proofs that I've seen, so I've done my best to try to give you a good explanation, um, but if you don't jive with that explanation I just gave you, be sure to think about it and check out some other proofs. Now, having established that the number of edges in the boundary of each region is at least three, we can make a statement about the sum of all of these numbers. So let's do that, and we're going to call this sum big M. So big M is the sum of the number of edges in the boundary of each region. So that's the sum of mi from i equals one to i equals r. What do we know about this sum? Well, we're adding up these mi's. We're adding up r of them. Every one of them is at least three. So this sum in total is at least three times r, three times the number of regions, three times the number of mi's that we're adding together. So now let's, let's write this in a separate inequality down here. We've got that three times R is less than or equal to big M. So we've bounded it below. Now, can we also bound it above? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to think about this. How many times are the edges of the graph being counted in this sum? Well, let's think about it. If an edge lies on a cycle, then that edge is part of this curve that encloses a region. And so the edge will be counted in the boundary of that enclosed region, and it will also be counted in the boundary of the region outside of that closed region. That might be the exterior region, or it might be a region that's also closed by some other curve. But again, we'll just say that one more time. If an edge lies on a cycle, then it's going to be counted in the boundary of that region it encloses, and it's going to be counted in the boundary of the region outside of that region, which could be the external region, or it could be some other region. We can see here, for example, this edge is counted as the boundary in this region, and it's part of the boundary of this region. On the other hand, so just to say that one more time here, uh, in this sum, in this sum of all the edges 
in the boundaries of our regions. If an edge is on a cycle, it's gonna get counted twice. If an edge isn't on a cycle and is thus a bridge of the graph, then it's only going to be counted once because it's not going to be part of a cycle, a closed curve that encloses a region. And so it's only going to be incident with the external region. So it's only gonna be part of one boundary. So it's only gonna be counted once in this sum. Sorry to interrupt, just wanna make a quick correction. A bridge of a graph does not have to be in the boundary of the exterior region. The bridge could be itself contained within some other region and thus would be in the boundary of that region. Either way, it will be in the boundary of just one region. You're seeing both possibilities on the whiteboard now. All right, on with the rest of the lesson. So in total, what we've just said is that if we add up the number of edges in the boundaries of our regions, every edge is going to be counted at most twice. They're only gonna be counted twice if they're on a cycle, otherwise they'll be counted just once. So when we add all those numbers together, it's going to be at most two times the number of edges. That's the biggest it could be, which would be if every edge lied on a cycle and was thus counted twice in the boundary of two regions. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we can apply Euler's formula. What does Euler's formula tell us? Well, it tells us the number of vertices in the graph, n, minus the size, that's the number of edges, m, plus the number of regions, r, is equal to two. Now, we don't know a whole lot about r, but we do know something about 3r. So let's multiply both sides of this equation by three. That's gonna give us six. I'm gonna write it over here so we have more room. Three times two, that's six, is equal to three times n minus three times m plus three times r. Now we know 3r is less than or equal to 2m. So if we substitute 2m, well, not technically substituting, but if we replace 3r with 2m, we're going to make the quantity either bigger or it will stay the same. It's gonna be less than or equal to, right? Because we're making 3r into 2m, which is at least as big as 3r, so the quantity we get will be at least as big as the quantity we originally had. So we've got, this is less than or equal to 3n minus 3m plus 2m. We replaced 3r with a number that's at least as big as it. Now clearly there's some simplification here. 3n, or excuse me, minus 3m plus 2m, that's going to be just minus m. So we have 3n minus m. Look at that, 3n minus m. All right, so in total, what is this inequality? This is 6 is less than or equal to 3n minus m. Let's write that. 6 is less than or equal to 3n minus m. Solve for m. Add it to both sides and subtract 6. What have we got? We've got m is less than or equal to 3n minus 6. Ta-da! And that completes the proof for connected planar graphs. I think it's certainly a bit surprising we have that if a graph is planar and connected, if it can be drawn in the plane with no edge crossings, then its number of edges can at most be three times its number of vertices minus six. All right, now what about a disconnected planar graph? Well, if we draw a disconnected planar graph in the plane, we can certainly add edges to get a connected plane graph. Imagine this, we just line up the components of the disconnected planar graph, pick a vertex that's in the boundary of the exterior region for all of those components, and then just add edges to connect them together. When we do that, we'll get a connected plane graph that has more edges. Now we just showed connected plane graphs have to satisfy this inequality. So if the number of edges in that connected plane graph is less than or equal to 3n minus six, then certainly in the disconnected planar graph that had fewer edges, it also satisfied this inequality. And so the result holds for all planar graphs that have at least three vertices. Remember to specify that, at least three vertices. So amazing. Now two quick notes before we call it quits for the day. Notice that this is a necessary condition for a planar graph. So if a graph is planar with at least three vertices, then it satisfies this inequality. So if a graph has at least three vertices and doesn't satisfy this condition, 
we know it's non-planar. So this is a really nice, easy to work with, sufficient condition to determine that a graph is non-planar. And that is pretty cool. And then the last thing I want to mention is that this 3n minus 6 upper bound is pretty special. It turns out if you draw a planar graph in the plane and try to add as many edges as possible until the addition of any other edge would result in an edge crossing, that maximal number of edges you'll be able to add is 3n minus 6. So this is an attainable upper bound. So we'll talk more about all of this in future lessons, but hopefully this helped you understand the proof of this wonderful corollary of Euler's formula. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. If you'd like to help support the channel, I really appreciate a small donation on PayPal or a small monthly pledge on Patreon. I'll leave links to those in the description. I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet.